the Bible records for us certain scriptures that we can use as lessons in life, as philosophies, as truisms, well not truisms, but as actual fact of how we should be. One of them that I really enjoyed was that when I was a child, I spoke as a child and I reasoned as a child would. But when I grew to be a man, I put away childish things. And I always thought about that when I first got saved because I learned that scripture very young and I used it in a song and I even rap it now in uh, Countdown Psalms. But the thing that I learned from it as a baby Christian was that I didn't think that I knew it all. You know, I didn't take this persona of thinking that I had it down and that I understood all things, that there wasn't more to learn from God than what I already knew about God. Because you see, I remember reading a scripture one time and the first time I read it, I got something out of it. And the second time I read it, I got something different out of it. And then I began to realize as I considered these things and I wanted to know from God, how come you know, I seem to be rereading you know, different portions over and over again. And God finally showed me that at times, for what you need at the moment, you will see certain things that fit for you. It's kind of like when you're a baby, you know? When you first start off as a little baby in the crib, you get baby formula. You know, you really can't handle meat. You can't handle steak. You can't eat shrimp. You know, I mean, these are just things that, even if you blended them, they're really not that good for a baby. There's some things that people can do, you know, and they make all these really cute little formulas for them. And you know, if you've ever tasted baby food in the old days, it tasted like crap. Because <laughs> I don't know that they either thought babies didn't know the difference or they didn't care because the baby couldn't complain anyways. Oh, yes, they can. But, you know, they began to realize that parents were tasting the baby food, so they started making flavors for them and developed them into different, you know, formulas. Well, formulas are designed specifically for babies, you know, to grow. That's kind of why you have, you know, stem cells nowadays, that they know that stem cells can develop the body into certain things and cause it to grow in certain ways that normal cells can't repair themselves and do. And so those stem cells use a certain type of formula from the body. And that way they are able to accomplish their purpose. And God does the same thing with us, is that, when we first get saved, there's some things that you'll learn that, you know, just seem like they're redundant, you know, like John 3.16, for God so loved the world. You know, you think you've learned it and you got it down, you know, and then you realize later on when you get out in the world that it means more than what you thought. It means that, you know, the, the Muslim or the Mormon or the, the Hindu or the Pakistani or the... Lebanese or the Palestinian or the Jew or someone that you don't like you know from a different culture or race that's the world you know those are people of the world and that God so loved the world that means God loves them and sometimes when you get older you begin to realize wow that's important for me to relearn or to apply better than what I learned it as when I was first saved. You know, like, kind of, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, that's not really a scripture, but it applies to understanding a certain amount of scripture. And if you really apply that to the world, you would say, Jesus loves the world, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then you wouldn't have these prejudices. You couldn't allow them to exist. There wouldn't be this hostility towards other people. Because if there was, you would be contradictory to what you had learned about God. So sometimes it's necessary to relearn the things that you knew or you thought you knew as a child. Because when you were a child, you just reasoned like a child would. But when you grow to be a man, you need to reconsider what you've learned and make sure that you have a lot of the meaning out of it that you need for life itself. Because God didn't put you in the world to condemn the world. God put you in the world to be a representative of His kingdom, to be a manifestation of His love and His grace, to be that person who would be merciful
to be giving, to be caring, to be loving, to be kind, to be gentle, to be Christ-like. And that's what Christian means, to be Christ-like. That you are willing to die on the cross than to kill someone else. That you're willing to die on the cross for the love that you have for the world. That you're willing to die on the cross than to defend yourself or to defend your rights and privileges. So you see, even today as I'm saying these things, I'm sure some of you are rebelling and going, no, 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 you're wrong. That's, that, that's not, God doesn't want us a doormat. Well, it's not that Jesus was a doormat. Jesus was the door. And the door has a doormat. And you go through Jesus' actions and attitudes and way of living to become like him. And that's what we do. And we grow to become like him. Because the day will come when you may need to lay down your life. Not for your friend, which is easy to do. To lay down your life for your children or your friend or your family is no problem for most people. But to lay down your life for your enemies, now that's a big choice. That's a real struggle and a challenge to any person in life, much less a born-again Christian. But then, to lay down your life willingly and to forgive those who are in the process of killing you. Now that's a son of God. That is what we are learning to become like. And that's what Christ-like means. Because when the term first came out, Christ-likeness, it wasn't used as a positive Christian religion thing. It was used about Jews who were being killed and slaughtered easily because they wouldn't defend themselves and they were so easy to crucify that you could even set them on fire and they would still be rejoicing in God. They would be like Stephen when he was stoned. He looked up and saw the Son of God seated at the right hand of the Father. It would be like all the disciples who had given their lives rather than protect their possessions. It was like Jesus himself who didn't carry a Glock or another weapon in order to defend himself but said, hey, if I needed a defense, I could call down angels from heaven. My father would send them, and I would wipe out the universe, literally. So you see, Christ-likeness really is about being like Jesus. And it's a process of learning. You know, you don't become that overnight, because obviously a lot of people are raised with violence and actions and reactions, and so they have to defend themselves. They get into situations that God did not want them to be in, you know, like say, abusive marriages, or confusing societies, or issues that they don't realize are consequences of sin. They're not the actual things that God wanted us for us, or God would lead us to in the end, but that he would take us beyond this life into something that was going to be through eternity. And you don't want to take into heaven the idea that you need a gun to protect yourself. You don't want to take into heaven the idea that you want to hate someone you don't want to take into heaven the idea that you have this fleshy attitude that is wrong and you were taught wrong because that's childishness, that's sinfulness, that's thinking like a child. But you see, it's time to grow up and to become a man. And a man doesn't defend his country, doesn't defend his home, doesn't defend his honor, doesn't defend all these things. We should say, rather, a worldly man does. But the man that I make my life a pattern after, the man that I follow even unto death, that he has said that if they have crucified the master, so too will they crucify the servant. For the servant is not greater than the master. So you see, this Christian thing that we talk about Christ-likeness is not easy. It is not something that is conformable to just calling it a Christian religion and getting away with it by we're just going to go smoothly sailing and do what we want with where we're at. But we have to deal with the living God who we're going to spend eternity with. And because he said that his son was the example, then that gives us the reason why we ought to follow him and not our own reasonings, our own thinking, our own understanding. That's why we trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him and letting Him direct our path. Because even with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with Mishael, uh, I can't think of all their Hebrew names, but 
They said the epitome of what a Christian life is all about. Whether we live or whether we die, whether you throw us in the fire or whether we perish in the flames or we live, it doesn't matter to us because we will not bow down. We will not act in any other way except to worship the Lord our God. And you, so you know there is a God and He's greater than everything else. So whether our life is taken or kept, it doesn't matter. But there is a God. And that's kind of like where we're at, you know. You could live your life, you know, all worried and protected and, you know, you've got your guns and you've got your security systems and you've got your videos and you've got everything all around you, you know, keeping you safe and holy and protected and righteous and pure and, you know, kind of like all caught up into this little tiny bubble, you know, that keeps you safe. And God forbid that anything comes into the bubble because if it shatters your protection, suddenly you fear. But, you know, there's nothing you can do to a man who doesn't fear death but knows where he's going. There's nothing that you can take from a man who has nothing in this world but to give his life and his love for the one who loved him in the first place. There's nothing that that man can fear or be afraid of except that he would not live up to the high calling of what Jesus has done for him. Because that is what our salvation message is. It's not about getting God and then going on and being abundantly blessed so that you can make a kingdom for yourself or make a mess of your life by getting into now a Christian mess as opposed to a worldly mess. No. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So the man of God as opposed to the child of God as opposed to the baby Christian, when it's time to grow up to become a man of God, you need to learn these things and apply them to your life because church is a preparation. Church is a development stage. Sunday school is meant to train you to become likened unto the Son of God, to exercise your ability to study on your own, to be taught of God, to be led by God so that God could lead you in life. So that if you were caught into a situation where, yes, there is violence around you, then you would have the Holy Spirit at that time to lead you either in it, out of it, or to go through it, and maybe even die as a martyr. Because the only one that can take you through that is God. You cannot be Christ-like by your own efforts. You cannot be Christian, which is what Christ-like means, by doing it some kind of religious way. The only way that you actually can be Christian is by Jesus living in you. First John made it very clear, he who has the Son hath life, he who is not the Son of God has not life. When Jesus is alive so much so in you, then it becomes obvious by your words, your actions, and your deeds of who you trust in. Because you see, if I have to reach into my back and pull out a gun, then I know I don't trust God. But you see, if I already know that I trust God, I can go anywhere, do anything, and say anything that God leads me to, because He is my salvation. Being a man of God is not easy. Because it's easy to return to being a child or being a baby. And we all want to be like that because we want what we want when we want it. But God would have us to grow up into the full stature of Jesus, to become like him even into his death, to be made conformable into the image of the Son of God even unto his crucifixion. So don't be surprised if what your goal is, is to die. Because... For me, to die is to gain. Christ in me is to live, but to die is to gain. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide you with mine eye. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and go out and find pasture. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. No man, having Thus, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way, 
which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Growing in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ causes us to love more. Growing in the knowledge of God Almighty himself as he reveals himself through his word and through our lives causes us to recognize that God is love. When you try to change God into the image of man, you will always find this conflict of interest going on between what Jesus is, what God is, and what man does. Because man, when he's not operating according to what God says to do, will always contradict scripture. And you can see that obviously in wars and murmurings and fightings and divisions and strife. But when people love as God said to, when people choose to follow Jesus with mercy and grace, to walk in the path that he's chosen for us, then you find the fullness of God being made manifest in your life as well as in the lives of others that you talk to and share with. You don't find yourself in conflict you find yourself having compassion upon others. That is what God wants us to be, full of compassion and mercy and grace. Because after all, that is what God did for us. And that is what God is doing with us. And that is what God has for us. He is choosing to make us into his image, not we make ourselves into our own image of what we think God wants us to be. Thank <laughs> you.